Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, be beloveds, there is still much work to be done. So good morning again, and welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. I'm the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. I serve this congregation uh, as your minister. One of the true pleasures of the last year, and yes, there have been true pleasures of worship in the last year, has been the opportunity to get to hear from voices across Unitarian Universalism and across the country. As we are not bound by the walls of 6300 A Street, we are casting our net wide to hear from folks in our denomination. So it is a pleasure this morning uh, to get to introduce the Reverend Sarah Scotchko to the congregation as she'll be leading worship at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln this morning. Reverend Scotchko attended Meadville Lombard Theological School and has an MFA in poetry. She served as the coordinator of outreach and engagement at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene, Oregon, and now lives in Austin, Texas. I'm excited to welcome Reverend Scotchko as a friend and also excited to hear what she has to say. Her, her topic this morning is timely and engaging. With that, I will turn the, the camera and the service over to her and we'll get started. Good morning. I'm Reverend Sarah Scotchko, privileged and blessed to be joining you for worship this morning from Austin, Texas, where believe it or not, it's been pretty cold this week, even with some snow and some ice, though probably not as cold as in Nebraska. I hope all of you are staying warm, staying connected, and attending to your faith. I'm glad you're here. Happy Valentine's Day also to all those who celebrate. This month, your church is considering the worship theme of beloved community. And today, we're going to be talking about a paradise built in hell, Rebecca Solnit's book. It's about the way beloved community comes together and responds in the wake of disaster and tragedy. How the worst of times can bring out the best in us and what we can learn from those times when we have to rebuild. It's about the beloved community that we hope to build for the future. Come, let us worship together. Unitarian Universalist congregations, we light a chalice when we come together for worship. If you have a chalice at home, I invite you to light one now, but I'll light one for all of us as we sanctify this holy time we share and the holy space made up of all our spaces as we worship together. Our chalice-lighting words come from Christine Robinson, who writes, 
We gather this hour as people of faith, with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning, in celebration of the life we share together. for this morning comes from children's book authors Mac Barnett and John Classen, and it's about making the best of an unusual situation. It's called The Wolf, the Duck, and the Mouse. Early one morning, a mouse met a wolf, and he was quickly gobbled up. Oh, whoa, said the mouse. Oh, me, here I am, caught in the belly of the beast. I fear this is the end. Be quiet, someone shouted, I'm trying to sleep. The mouse shrieked, who's there? A light was lit. A duck lay in bed. Well, said the duck. Oh, said the mouse. Is that all, asked the duck. It's the middle of the night. The mouse looked around. Well, out there, it's morning. Is it, said the duck. It's so hard to tell. I do wish this belly had a window or two. In any case, breakfast. The meal was delicious. Where did you get jam? Asked the mouse. And a tablecloth. The duck munched a crust. You'd be surprised what you find inside a wolf. It's nice, said the mouse. It's home, said the duck. You live here? I live well. I may have been swallowed but I have no intention of being eaten. For lunch, they made soup. The mouse cleared his throat. Do you miss the outside? I do not, said the duck. When I was outside, I was afraid every day that wolves would swallow me up. In here, there's no worry. The duck had a point. Can I stay? The mouse asked. Of course, the duck said. This called for a dance. The ruckus inside made the wolf's stomach ache. Oh, woe, said the wolf. Oh, shame. Never have I felt such aching and pain. Surely it must have been something I ate. The duck shouted up, I have a cure. You do, asked the wolf. Yes, an old remedy sure to settle your stomach. Eat a good hunk of cheese and a flagon of wine and some beeswax candles. That night, they feasted. The duck made a toast to the health of the wolf. But the wolf felt worse. I feel like I'll burst. It hurts just to move. A hunter heard the wolf moan. He fired a shot, but missed in the dark. The duck called up, run, run for our lives. The wolf tried to escape, but he tripped and got trapped in an old oak tree's roots. Oh, woe, said the duck. Oh, doom, what can we do? I fear this is the end. The mouse stood up. We must fight. We must try. Tonight we ride to defend our home. Charge! Oh, woe, said the hunter. Oh, death. These woods are full of evil and wraiths. He fled from the forest and never returned. The wolf bowed down to the duck and the mouse. You saved my life when I thought not to spare yours. Ask a favor of me. I will be glad to grant it. Well, you can guess what they asked for. And that's why the wolf howls at the moon. Oh, woe, oh, woe. Every night he howls at the moon, oh, woe. And that is our story for today. Each week, we take up a collection to the gods for no more snow. That doesn't seem to be working. So this week, we're taking up a collection to support all of the good work we do here at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. If you feel so obliged, text UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. 
Once again, that's UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. Stay warm. My wish for each of us this week is that we find joy in the little things. A beautiful tree silhouetted against the sky, the giggle of a child, the first crisp bite of an apple, the way the snow crunches beneath our feet, or the kindness of a stranger. It is these little things that make up happiness. Joy comes in sips, not gulps. Sharing sorrows can be a bit more difficult. The places that hurt us may be intensely personal. Sometimes we cannot yet speak of these things that are too personal or too raw. And yet love calls us on, on toward the healing that comes from knowing that we are held in the embrace of a universal love and in the embrace of people here who cannot always heal what is hurting, but who will walk beside each of us as we move through the sorrow any one of us may be carrying. As you listen to this next song, may you type your name or the name of someone you wish to have us hold in joy or in sorrow. Thank you for your presence.
This reading comes to us from Reverend Sean Parker Dennison, and it's called Letter from Our Better Angels. Dear one, we have received your letter, and we hate to tell you, well, not hate so much, but are afraid to say, we cannot grant your requests as stated, but can only remind you of familiar things. First, faith, faith in yourself and trust in others. We know it can be terrifying to be vulnerable, but only when you share your softest side will we be able to break through. Next, hope. Hope is not an empty fairy tale. It is the true story of all the times human beings like you have found a way to create the future though you didn't know how. And of course, love. Love that demands you cherish all people, not just yourself and safety. Love that is not satisfied until every argument ends abruptly when one child says, that hurts. There is so much to learn and relearn. The world teaches you to be hard, to negotiate and defend, to avoid giving too much and to the wrong people. There are no wrong people. You also are not wrong. And when you encounter the poor, the broken, the unhoused and unwelcome, you are looking if you pay attention at us, calling to you, calling you to answer your own prayers. If you want to change the world first, be sure you are changing yourself. Be tender, be kind, be at peace. Be all the things you wish for. Be your own better self. It isn't without cost, but it will be free. On the morning of April 18th, 1906, at 5.11 a.m. in the morning, everything in San Francisco was dark and quiet. One minute later, at 5.12 a.m., all hell broke loose. The San Francisco earthquake didn't just level a sizable portion of the bustling city. The ensuing fires from broken gas lines and toppled chimneys incinerated nearly 28,000 buildings, including nearly every municipal building. With the water mains all destroyed, there was no way to fight the fire. Rebecca Solnit writes of the disaster that 3,000 people had died. At least half the city was homeless. Families were shattered. The commercial district was smoldering, ashes, and the army from the military base at the city's north end, far from helping, was instead terrorizing the citizens. Despite or perhaps because of this, she writes, the people were, for the most part, calm and cheerful, and many survived the earthquake with gratitude and generosity. Having nowhere to go or fearing aftershocks or afraid to fall asleep before the approaching flames, thousands of San Franciscans slept in the street and in parks. Because fires had been banned indoors all over the city, people dragged their stoves out into the street and began to cook for their neighbors. Grocers turned out their entire stock onto the street for neighbors to take. Solnit recalls that survivor Edwin Emerson wrote after the quake, when the tents of the refugees, the funny street kitchens improvised from doors and shutters and pieces of roofing overspread all the city, such merriment became an accepted thing. Everywhere during those long moonlit evenings, one could hear the tinkle of guitars and mandolins from among the tents. When survivors described the weeks that followed the earthquake, they spoke not of terror, but of togetherness, a sense of duty and purpose, a camaraderie that had been lacking in city life, newly discovered. It was as if, when all the other social structures and obligations fell away, a temporary utopia arose to meet the moment. In her book, A Paradise Built in Hell, Rebecca Solnit examines this phenomenon, the curiously positive way that survivors speak about some disasters, the resourcefulness, generosity, and willingness to face the impossible that humans show even when everything has been destroyed, even when their loved ones are missing. 
I've witnessed it myself. I remember huge power outages as a child in the Northeast. Some neighbor would start grilling before all the food in the freezers went bad, and before you know it, there'd be a block party. Blizzards in Philadelphia when all the neighbors you'd never met before would come out to help shovel each other's cars out. There's a sense of purpose and connection in recovering from these shared setbacks. Now, as a Unitarian Universalist, I find a lot of hope in these little paradises in hell. Because isn't that one of our great religious projects? To bring about the kingdom of God on earth in this time and this place. So to see evidence that humans are not just capable but inclined to do that feeds my soul. Now, Solnit's book came out in 2009, in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis and Hurricane Katrina. I thought this might be a good moment, now in 2021, to revisit it, as we approach the terrible anniversary of one full year of living in crisis. Solnit writes that disasters are, most basically, terrible, tragic, grievous, and no matter what positive side effects or possibilities they produce, they're not to be desired. But by the same measure, she says, those side effects should not be ignored just because they arise amid devastation. The point is not to welcome disasters, she writes. They do not create these gifts, but they are one avenue through which these gifts arrive. Disasters, she says, provide an extraordinary window into social desire and possibility. And what manifests there matters elsewhere, in ordinary times and in other extraordinary times. I think amidst the wreckage of our current moment, there are signs of hope that human nature is not a selfish competition to the death, that human nature is to take care of one another. There's evidence that the beloved community is doing just fine. And I'll tell you, having recently been to a Costco in Texas and witnessing people fighting about having to wear masks, I need the reminder from time to time that the antisocial among us do not define what it is to be human. Throughout her book, Solnit argues, the belief that most people are just waiting for the chance to steal from their neighbors is totally unfounded. And fears about mass civil unrest after hurricanes or earthquakes never turns out to be true. What is true is that some small percentage of people, usually privileged, act out that unfounded fear by targeting minorities. The way Asian elders have been attacked during the pandemic, the way the media focused on black people looking for supplies after Katrina as looters. In reality, Solnit argues, most communities do a great job of taking care of each other to the extent that our survival truly comes down, not to how much ammo we have to fend off our neighbors, but to how strong our friendships with our neighbors are. Our survival after an earthquake doesn't come down to how much water we have stockpiled selfishly for ourselves, but whether our neighbors have stockpiled water for us all. Once you've lived through a communal shared experience of making it through, many societies go through a time of reckoning, of deciding how to go forward and what to do differently, what to change and what to hold on to. And although nothing can make up for this past year and all that has been lost, particularly in terms of human life, something that gives me hope is the unprecedented possibility of this moment in the moment of disaster, Solnit writes, the old order no longer exists as people improvise rescues, shelters, and communities. Thereafter, a struggle takes place over whether the old order with all its shortcomings and injustices will be imposed. Or a new one, perhaps more oppressive or perhaps more just and free, like the disaster utopia will arise. In other words, I think we are learning things that we can't unlearn, and they will shape the beloved community for years to come. 
Solnit writes that many events plant seeds, imperceptible at the time, that bear fruit long afterward. And I keep coming back to that. When the government announced that medical bills for COVID would all be covered, I saw many people on Twitter wonder, in that case, why not cover diabetes? Why not asthma or cancer? And once these questions start being asked sooner or later, they're going to have to be answered. Millions of Americans lost their jobs, a wave that hit low-income people the hardest. The $600 a week federal unemployment benefit came out to $15 an hour, a number that activists have been fighting to raise the minimum wage to for years. So for the first time, millions of people saw materially how their lives would be different if they were more fairly compensated for their time and labor. That knowledge cannot be undone. Student loan payments have been paused for almost a year and the government hasn't collapsed, at least not from that, leading some of my friends to ask whether they really needed to be paid back anyway. The unfair conditions under which parents must raise their young in America have been starkly highlighted as well as the incredible necessity of our schools and the need for affordable childcare and paid time off. While we are still in the eye of that storm now, do not forget somewhere in the background that it won't be even two decades before the children of the pandemic can vote. We've seen billionaires profiteering off this disaster, but despite their outsized impact, they are outliers in their values. Solnit writes, at large in disaster are two populations, a great majority that tends towards altruism and mutual aid, and a minority whose callousness and self-interest often become a second disaster. Well, in the face of that second disaster, mutual aid networks have sprung up around America, arguably like never before. I read on Twitter recently that leftist Twitter has been passing around the same $15 to whoever needs it since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that generosity will not be forgotten. Solnit writes, it's tempting to ask why, if you fed your neighbors during the time of the earthquake, why you didn't do so before or after. We need one another. And people who didn't know that before know it now. They'll carry that knowledge into the beloved community of the future. I just joined my neighborhood Buy Nothing group and people have been putting baskets of arts and craft supplies up to pass around the neighborhood and keep each other's kids occupied. We know what's possible now. I just keep coming back to that quote. Many events plant seeds, imperceptible at the time, that bear fruit long afterward. Have you heard of the Fauci effect? The number of applicants to med schools is up nearly 20% compared to last year. There's something about sitting inside by yourself, wishing you could help in some way, that seems to be spurring people on. Do you remember the nightly cacophony in New York when neighbors from high rises would bang pots and pans and cheer every night at 7 p.m. at the shift change for hospitals. Now the cheering is not enough to make up for mask shortages or brutal working conditions, but it may have been enough to make an extra 20% of med school applicants think, I want to make that much of a difference in people's lives. We cannot know what seeds have been planted during this time and what fruit will be born from them after. Let me emphasize again that nothing to come can make up for the sheer loss of human life. And we must not overlook the incredible opportunity for change, for discovery, for beloved community that comes from having to band together in ways that most of us never had to before. Getting back to the earthquake in 1906, Rebecca Solnit says that one woman who was just eight and a half years old during the 1906 quake found herself struck less by the earthquake, more by the aftermath. What I remember most plainly about the earthquake, she wrote later, was the human warmth and kindliness of everyone afterward 
For days, refugees poured out of burning San Francisco and camped in Idura Park and the racetrack in Oakland. People came in their night clothes. There were newborn babies. Mother and all of our neighbors were busy from morning to night cooking hot meals. They gave away every extra garment they possessed. They stripped themselves to the bone in giving, forgetful of the morrow. While the crisis lasted, people loved each other. Now that girl was Dorothy Day, the activist, anarchist, and champion of social justice. Longing for a connection with a loving God, longing for religion, she converted to Catholicism at 30 and spent the rest of her life fighting to meet the needs of the poor. The Dorothy Days who will build the beloved community of tomorrow are living this time, now, learning from the ways we arise to meet this occasion, learning from the paradise we build now in hell. As Rebecca Solnit writes, many events plant seeds imperceptible at the time that bear fruit long afterward. May it be so. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. time of worship has come to an end, so let us extinguish our chalice. As Martha Kirby Capo writes, our time together is finished, but our work is not done. May our spirits be renewed and our resolve strengthened as we meet the challenges of the week to come. The chalice flame is extinguished until we light it again with the spark of our communion. Amen. <laughs>